all so much for coming to today's program, um, our first Juneteenth program. So um, I would like to thank Betsy and Denise for helping us put this program on in conjunction with the talk series. Um, most of you probably know that we um, have from the Mayor's Commission was created a race equity and diversity team of employees. And one of the first, this is one of the first events that they are in partnership with the Grand for. So um, we wanna thank you for being in support of it. Um, some of you may have came for food, but thank you for stopping by here first. We appreciate that. <laughs> um, so before we get started, I do um, want to also thank um, Harry Eady, who will be joining me here in just a second, uh, from Denton Black Film Festival. They actually helped us acquire this speaker that you'll hear today. Um, so with Harry's help, uh, we are able to put on uh, this program so I'm going to bring him up, if you could please give him a warm welcome. So Harry, can you join me? I'd like to say good morning. Hopefully everyone's doing great. As Tamara said, my name is Harry Eady, and I'm the executive director of the Denton Black Film Festival, which you may or may not have heard of. But I'm really excited to be with you today uh, as a person who was not a native Texan, uh, which I was told quite a bit, <laughs> go home, right? Uh, I was unaware of uh, Juneteenth. And uh, the person I'm going to introduce here in a second uh, is someone that I've known since, you know, 1980. Uh, but first to let you know, he is a native uh, Texan. He's from Houston originally. Um, he is a public historian, uh, resides in Denton, Texas. Uh, he has authored more than 15 books, and he has degrees in music education, counseling, uh, study services from UNT, but formerly uh, NTSU, right? North Texas State University. But that only really tells the part of the story. When I arrived in the early 80s, uh, people told me about this person named Donald Cox, and I just found out recently his name is Donald Norman Cox. But the first thing they said about Donald is that he is brilliant. And uh, I, you know, I then thought maybe I need to meet this guy as quickly as I can. But as I met Donald, I figured out a few more things about him. Uh, the first thing is that uh, Donald really loves people, which I began to understand. Next thing was Donald has a tremendous appetite and love for education. And most importantly to me, Donald spent, at least for the first probably 15 years that I knew him, he was constantly running youth programs, educational programs for kids of all ages, color, sizes, you name it. But he was surrounded by young men and young women who are now much older, they are adults and they have their own children, and they always remember him. Uh, and lastly, uh, just to let you know, that I have been tremendously impacted because of the things that Donald has shared with me over the years. And I know that communities at large, whether they be Houston, Denton, Louisville, we've all been enriched by the knowledge that Donald has bestowed upon us. So without further ado, I wanna introduce Donald Norman Cox to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. I appreciate it. Thank you, audience. Uh, my name is Donald J. Norman Cox. Uh, uh, before we get started here, I want to clarify something. You all uh, employees of Louisville, so when, when Harry uh, introduced uh, my educational background, and he said I graduated from UNT and, and formerly from NTSU, I make sure people say that because my degree says NTSU, and they can give me a new one. <laughs> so I, that's, that's what that was. It wasn't that we didn't think that you knew. <laughs> uh, I'm here today to talk about uh, Juneteenth, information that we all have heard um, and now we're hearing on a daily basis all day from morning until
until like this is going to go on until um, the 20th. And then we'll get a break for a year and it'll come back around because, as you know, Juneteenth now is a national holiday. Um, Some of that better. Uh, the uh, national holiday called the Juneteenth is actually um, <coughs> there are two holidays. There's the state one and there's the national one. It is uh, commonly believed that the national holiday was a nationalization of the state holiday. But if you read the uh, document that created the national holiday, you won't find any reference whatsoever to Dallas or Texas or whatever. That uh, the national Juneteenth is not an enlargement of what we in Texas uh, know as um, Juneteenth. The difference between the two is that. Texas Emancipation Day, which is the formal name of Juneteenth in Texas. That day is all about what happened in Galveston, uh, June 19th, uh, 1865. The national holiday can be compared to Memorial Day, and that there were people who died on Memorial Day, but there were people who died year-round. And so Memorial Day is simply a symbolic day to celebrate all uh, military personnel that died while in service. Likewise, the national holiday acknowledges Juneteenth um, emancipation, regardless of when it happened, where it happened, or how it happened in the United States. Um, there is contrary to, like, I've been warned not to say this you know, uh, when I go home to Houston or whatever. Um, there is nothing that happened in Galveston on June 19th, 1865 that warrants national attention. We were not, contrary to what you may have heard, we were not the last state that uh, emancipated slaves. News did not, was not late arriving to in, in, uh, in Texas. You know, all that stuff that we've heard, that's not, that, those, that's all it is. That it's just grown up, and it, was, it impressed enough people to get a national holiday, <laughs> you know? But I am taking it all as a personal mission to say, let's get this right, you know? I mean, we get the holiday, now let's make sure we know what we are celebrating. Some of you, should be saying, what's he talking about? And is that true? And, and whatever. So let me just let me show you something. Um, the holiday that we call Juneteenth, supposedly, was when the word got to Texas. Everybody's heard of that. And I know you can't see it. But you gotta take my word for it. I mean, you believe in everything else. So you're not sure. <laughs> this is the Houston paper from eight from uh, eight October eighteen sixty two. In this column is an article titled "Emancipation Proclamation." You printed the entire thing in the Houston paper three years before Juneteenth. It's also published in 125, 124 other Texas newspapers that I found. A group that I spoke to last night, I informed them that when I was doing my research um, about uh, the news arriving in Texas, I stopped counting at 125. That doesn't mean that there were not more I stopped counting because if you don't believe 125, you're not going to believe 126. So you don't <laughs> for anything, you know? That's enough for me. <laughs> and so I published all of them in that. My, this is my book that I um, 
wrote by accident. I, I didn't intend to do it. You know, I just had gotten so much information that I was afraid I was going to forget it. And so I sent it somewhere to be bound. And when I, when I got back, it was booked. <laughs> Look at that, you know? <laughs> and so that, that's how, and it, it was thinner, and it was half the size of this. But I have constantly found more information. I have some new information that I'm working on now. Uh, it's getting more and more difficult to research things um, because you know I have to have proof that it happened because what I'm telling people is so obtuse to what they are familiar hearing that um, I, I have to have proof. And so when I get it, then um, I add it to the book. It's not another edition. The book just gets fatter. <laughs> and so the copy that you have today, next year, that same book might have some extra pages in it. Nothing else changes, I just add to it, you know, and, and it just gets bigger and bigger. Um, the issue about the, the news arriving in Texas adds to the, uh, well, that two and a half year thing. Um, one of the, the incorrect thoughts that people have is that Texas was two and a half years behind everybody else in being emancipated. That's not so. Um, Texas emancipated, emancipation began in Texas only 30 days before it began in Florida. And Florida started only 10 days um, after, did I say about it? Florida did it 30 days before Texas, and Mississippi did it 10 days before Florida. And you can just go right on down the line. There were 10 states. The, the proclamation only applies to 10 states, but there were 15 states that um, they had slaves. I'm going to show you. Okay. Um, the proclamation only applied to the states that are in gray. The states that are black and the parts of states that are black, um, which there are four uh, states there, uh, they were not included. They were slaveholding states, but they were not included in the uh, Emancipation Proclamation. They ended slavery when they chose to do so. And as a result, two of them chose not to do anything. So Texas, because of the war, um, and Texas was forced to emancipate. But one of the reasons why they didn't was because there were other states who were allowed to keep theirs. And so Texas said, well, if the war is over, if they can keep theirs, then why can't we keep ours? You know, and um, so there were two, uh, Kentucky and Delaware, of all states. Delaware and Kentucky were the last two states, and they emancipated slaves six months after Texas. Uh, Texas was simply the last of the 10 that were required to do so. I found seven reasons why they held on. Um, one is because when Washington, D.C. was uh, emancipated, the slave owners were compensated. And so Texans wanted to be compensated. Um, and then there was that idea, well, if, it, if they can keep theirs, then I want to keep mine. And, several others, and then the last, the, you know, uh, reason number seven was because some slaveholders, owners, were just evil, <laughs> you know, and they were not going to reduce, um, emancipate them regardless of the uh, circumstance, and some of them didn't. Uh, one guy in Texas, well, he had a, he hid his slaves for two years um, after Juneteenth. And um, they were found because he was a thief. 
and he would go around and, and he'd steal stuff. And so he stole from the wrong place one day and they killed him. And so when they went to his farm to inform whomever was there, they found a lot of slaves tied up in a building that he had been keeping for uh, a couple of years. Um, so there were a lot of people who refused to acknowledge emancipation even after enforcement began uh, in 1865. Now, let's talk about something else. Juneteenth didn't actually begin in 65 um, or 66 on the anniversary. The uh, holiday, the celebration in all, all over the state, uh, it took four to six weeks to actually emancipate everybody that could be emancipated. And um, each community celebrated on the day that was the anniversary of their emancipation. Galveston was on the 19th, so Galveston celebrated on the 19th. Uh, Houston was emancipated on June 20th. Therefore, Houston's celebration was on the 20th for several years. Austin was the 23rd. And so they celebrated on the 23rd, and you can go right on down the line. Galveston was the only place that was emancipated on that day. Because when the word was spread, you know, they didn't have, they had a telegram, telegraph machines, but that was it. And so, and, and it wasn't a matter of spreading the news, it was a matter of putting gunpoint putting guns in people's heads and said, let them go. You know, we're serious here. You know, because they already knew that, that about the proclamation. They just refused to do it. So when the guns came out, then that's, you know, what was uh, causing the emancipation to happen, not spreading of the word. A lot of the news reports or whatever will say when the word arrived in Galveston and then the state erupted into a you know, uh, a big party. Well, that didn't happen. Only Galveston got the word, and then the military had to travel to another place to force them, and then the next place to force them. It was, it was a route that they took. In doing that, um, everybody was celebrating on their respective day. Well, the way this became a holiday originally, I mean, a big a statewide celebration, was, I'm going to point out a couple of people here. If uh, this gentleman sold to this gentleman uh, some slaves, and then the slaves were free, this gentleman didn't want to pay him his money. He said, well, you know, I bought some slaves, and now I don't, my product is gone. So I don't owe you anything. So a lot of people started suing each other, you know, because it was all about money. Eventually, those lawsuits made it to the Texas Supreme Court. And in October of uh, 69, 1869, the court had to make a decision of when slavery ended. They didn't pick January 1, which was when the proclamation was issued, because the proclamation was issued by Abraham Lincoln, who was president of the United States, and Texas was not part of the United States. They were part of the Confederacy at the time. So that date had no legitimacy. Um, they didn't do it when the war ended because there was no way to enforce it. At that point, the proclamation became impactful for everybody, but there was no way to enforce it. So if you have a rule and you can't enforce the rule, you don't have a rule. The, um, date they picked was July, uh, I mean June 19th, because that was the day that the guns came out and said, we are going to enforce the law on, on that day. And so they announced that in October of 68, I said 69, maybe. they did it in October of 68. And word spread around the state that that was the day that slavery ended and so starting that next June, June 19th of 69, then a statewide celebration began and we have been celebrating it 
ever since. Um, that was the actual origin of Juneteenth, which let's talk about the word Juneteenth. Um, it is true that the word comes from June and 19th, putting things together. But one thing that the black community of 2020 and the black community of 1860 something, one thing that we had in common is that we don't necessarily use the whole word sometimes. Like hood, you know, <laughs> neighborhood, we just, you know, chop, chop that down, you know. And them, you know, has been reduced to nil, you know. <laughs> Ray Ray Mill, <laughs> whatever, you know, we, we cut it down. So they did the same thing. June and 19th became June. But what people think is that that word was slave vernacular. It was not. It didn't come into play until, first of all, until Juneteenth became a, a statewide celebration. And then it took several years before it actually merged into an acceptable turn. The evidence of that is not what's written, but what's not written. If June 19th is, if Juneteenth is what they called June 19th, then what did they call June 18th? You know, what about June 17th, 16th, 15th, 13th? What about July 19th? They, they didn't have a word for, there are 72 of those 10th days in a year. So there was no reason for them to have a designated name for one of the uh, for one of the days that had no purpose. It was only when that day had purpose that a word began to um, quite it. Um, I am on a clock, <laughs> and so it is time for me to hush my mouth and ask. Oh, it's not time for that. I got some more minutes, and I got some more information too. <laughs> okay, um, I want to show you something that puts the whole thing in perspective. This is a simplified version of, of a poster that I have called the uh, Periodic Table of Black Texans. All you get is just the dots, because that's all I can fit on here. The red, well, all, this, this is, uh, each dot represents one year that uh, blacks have been in Texas. When this was originally made, it was 20, the year 2019. So you can add a few more green dots there for, to get us up to 2020. All of, first of all, the first, that contrary to that 16, 19 thing, that, that's, that's those people on the East Coast. You know, our, the first slave in Texas came almost 100 years before the first slave on the East Coast. Um, it was 1528. Um, so all of the red and dark red represent the years of slavery in Texas. The difference between the red and dark red is that in the dark person, a portion, um, that's when we were part of other nations. Uh, Spain, um, you remember all of that? You show me? <laughs> okay. Um, the black part is the years of segregation. And the green part are the years of uh, the bottom green are the years that we are currently living in. That's when there were supposedly equal rights. Um, so when you say, why can't y'all get over it? Look at all that red up there, <laughs> you know? And one little line, one complete line of green and a little portion of a line of green. That's not very much. And to say, okay, that other stuff was just a long way away. That's about as ridiculous. I mean, expecting all of that to be forgotten reminds me of, of, of uh, something that um, I share, you know, now. 
Uh, if they didn't want me to say it, share it, they shouldn't have said it. Because I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna keep it a secret. Um, a, a school district in their county was asked about, asked how they teach about Juneteenth. And the official word from the uh, school district was that they don't because uh, Juneteenth happens in the summer and so they can't, um, they don't have time to do that. To which the reply was, July 4th happens two days, two weeks after um, <laughs> June 19th. And I bet you teach about that, <laughs> you know? And so there was no response to that. Uh, the, for perspective, we are at the halfway point now. Um, 1776, you see it up there, and that's in the middle. And if I mention that to you, that it is hard to get wrapped around how far away that was from now. From now, this year, back to 1776, I, I can't. I can't get my arms wrapped around that period of time. Double that time is the length of time that um, slavery and black people were enslaved in Texas. And so to expect all of that not just to be forgotten, but that the residual of it will have been wiped away, that doesn't mean that anybody is accusing anybody else that was living today, but it's, it's just ridiculous to say that there's no impact today from all of this other stuff, you know, that, that's going on. Uh, I mean, that, that preceded it. Um, so that, that's the answer to why we have uh, an emphasis on uh, learning history, et cetera, because it puts into perspective a lot of the conditions that are economic conditions that we are still suffering from. Speaking of economic conditions, I want to I give a couple of examples. One of the things, I mean, there are a lot of things that occur that we, have, we do now that came from uh, segregation or slavery. Uh, one is uh, playing the dozen. Who does not know what playing the dozen is? for our human definition. I don't see any, okay, good, that would have some hands. Okay, the closest example that you would remember, that you would know of, is your mama jokes. You know? uh, your mama this, your mama that. And it's like, okay, all of that is, came from playing the dozen, which is finding fault with somebody. You know, you, you, two people, are uh, criticizing each other and coming up with the most creative things that they can come up with to insult each other. That came from the fact that slaves were sold by the dozen if they had handicaps. You know, so we now put that on each other's mother. You know, your mama this, your mama, that is a throwback from slavery um, that we don't recognize, but that's what it is. Uh, another one, which every presentation I give, a lot of them put the watermelon out there because people tend to think that there's something wrong with black people uh, thinking black people uh, eating watermelon. You know, all that, it, it's an insult for somebody to draw a picture of a black person or take a picture of a black person, whatever. With, uh, uh, with watermelon, especially around the time of Jim T. You cannot insult me if I don't give you permission to insult me, you know? So as far as I'm concerned, I have a cheer, which starts at, you like watermelon? And my response is, yes, I do. I love watermelon, you should too. <laughs> you know? I am not insulted by that because watermelon was the first economic engine in the black community after emancipation. You throw a seed down, and out pops a plant that produces multiple watermelons, and you sell each one for a nickel. And you made some money. 
Because the nickel back then went a way a long way. And that's how they were able to buy things now. How did they buy all this acreage and all? And, and had nothing. You know, and here we are, you know, making a lot more than they did in a short way to, to, to buy, buy ass. <laughs> you know? Uh, instead of criticizing the, the consumption of watermelon, we should be using it as a tool to celebrate Juneteenth because that was one of the things that um, uh, made the holiday successful. Nobody eats a watermelon alone. People eat it as a group, especially white men. You know, there were no refrigerators, so they had to. So a group of friends would take a watermelon and split it together and enjoy what is called uh, let us break bread together. Anybody familiar with that? Architecture. It is a communal experience you know, that, that should be venerated, not criticized. Um, I think it's time now to answer some questions while Harry comes up. I want to explain what this thing is. Um, Denton County is, we believe, the only county in the United States that has its own Juneteenth flag. That other flag that you see, which is on the back of this one, is the private property of an organization based in uh, Louisiana. It is uh, copyrighted, although they don't charge anybody to utilize it. It was created, you know, I, I was okay with that. It wasn't all that comfortable, but I was okay with it. It was Louisiana, that is our neighbor. But when I found out that the, paint, the, the flag, the original flag that's behind here, the one that you see everywhere, that, that flag was created by Boston, and you know, okay, that was it. That's, you know, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so, so we had our own contest in Denton County for kids to create a flag, and a young lady in Louisville that attends Rockport, Rockbrook, uh, elementary school one, and this is our design. It, the flag is displayed, will be displayed at all Juneteenth activities in Denton County this year. On the 20th, 20th, it will be retired, given to her, and the contest will start again. The objective is to allow children to do their own research because we don't necessarily think that the schools will embrace Juneteenth, you know, as one district says, we might point to, you know, so, um, Harry. So, um, I would like us, if we could, just to give Donald a tremendous applause for the presentation. I, uh, So I've learned a lot over the last probably nine months in, in talking to Don. Oh, you even have a straw. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you do like watermelon. Yes, I do. I love watermelon. You should too. So um, the, the, the first thing, I have, a, I have a basic rule. We're going to the Q&A portion of uh, today's discussion. And that rule is, um, there are no dumb questions. There are no stupid questions. Uh, there are no questions where you wonder whether people think you are something, right? That's negative. So I would encourage you to just ask questions. We have a few questions that were provided to us. I have always questions, right? Uh, but uh, we want to see if any of you have questions from the very beginning, and then we'll just ask. We have about 20 minutes. So if anyone has a question, uh, the lovely Natasha is out, uh, ready to provide the mic if you have a question. Any question? Question. Growing up, I always knew Juneteenth as the Jubilee. I, when I was growing up, I didn't know that it was called Juneteenth. So can you speak to where that name came from, the Jubilee? 
Actually, I, I um, don't have, I cannot address that specific one, but um, there was no entity that authorized the word Juneteenth. It just became popular. Um, and so each community uh, had their own version of what they called their celebration. The June 19th was simply the day. It wasn't necessarily the name of the celebration. So there are multiple names that are given to uh, what we call Juneteenth. And other states have, you know, because I mentioned that, you know, the other states were vaccinated just a few weeks before us. And so um, they have uh, names also. For example, 8 of May. When I first heard of 8 of May, I thought they were talking about somebody. But it really means 8th of May. They shortened it because that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> so along with that, uh, one of the questions from the audience was, what is Juneteenth? So even though you've given us a presentation, if you had to do a little elevator pitch, what would you tell someone that Juneteenth is? On the national, speaking of the national Juneteenth, uh, I, in my opinion, Juneteenth is and should be uh, an opportunity for us to reflect on our progress. And I'm going to say our, I'm speaking of nationwide. Mm -hmm. Juneteenth not only emancipated blacks, but it emancipated white people too. Because, you know, it's one thing to be an owner, but all of that pressure that comes along with um, the mindset, you know, that, that's, that's, you know, that's a, that's a major weight. You know, that, that it comes up. Look at children. You know, children play together and they learn discrimination as they get older. You know, that's a burden to carry. You know, so you know, there was a lot. But uh, you know, as people with the chains, understand that in other locations, uh, Arizona, uh, there was slavery there, but it wasn't the black people who were slaves. Nobody talks about that. You know, I don't really have. All the details I had read about it, but not very much because that wasn't what I was studying. Um, I would say that Juneteenth is an opportunity for us to reflect on our progress because there's no way to move forward if we don't know where we came from, you know, or know where we're going. And so um, I would hope that that's what it evolves into. The mattress sales are going to happen. It is a national holiday. Uh, people are going to people are going to uh, remember Juneteenth because uh, government employees, uh, definitely national, you know, and, and you get trickled down, uh, get the day off, um, and so Juneteenth is going to survive because of. Because no one's going to want to give up their day off. The reason I'm bring, bringing it up is because there is another holiday that we have nationally that commemorates emancipation, but nobody knows about it because nobody got the day off and nobody lost any money or gained any money. And so they forgot all about it, but it's been on the book since 1948. It's called National Freedom Day. Does anybody celebrate that in here? No, you didn't even know it existed. <laughs> so, um, Juneteenth will not have that fate because, and only because, nobody's going to want to give up that free, you know, paid holiday. You know, eventually, once the sales kick in and all of that, you know, it, we're stuck with this one, the other one. The other one is just on the books. Other questions? Okay. Oh, down here. Sorry. While she is coming to him, I showed you the uh, the poster. The uh, code above will take you to 
this poster so you can see the whole thing there if you really didn't want to take my word for it. <laughs> Mr. Cox, first of all, thank you so much for this great presentation. I appreciate it. In looking at your illustration with the dots, I noticed in the ninth row there were green dots sandwiched between red and brown. The period that you referenced. Yes. And my question is, is there any significance to putting those green dots there between the red and the brown? I've got an idea of what that period is a reference to. I'm just trying to, mm. to see if I'm on track. Look, nine rows down. It, after the red. Right. The, the green that's there. Right. Green. Oh, okay, yeah. I, I, I had to visualize it. Um, during that period of time, black men had all the rights that white men had. Black women had all the rights that white women had, which is nothing. <laughs> so um, during uh, those years, that that's the period immediately after uh, emancipation, uh, we call Reconstruction. Um, the uh, Juneteenth celebrations, the, the earliest Juneteenth celebrations, were not parties, picnics, and all that other kind of stuff. Uh, they were opportunities for men to uh, learn how to vote. And I don't mean for whom to vote. They had to learn what is a vote. I mean, these people have been enslaved forever. They had no idea of politics. They didn't know any of that. They had to be taught what is a state, you know, what what, what is a city, you know, and they had to learn all of that stuff. So during Juneteenth celebrations is when they learned um, about politics and how how it worked. And they didn't have to be convinced to vote, you know. They just didn't know what it was. You know, I'll do it, but. Wait, <laughs> you know? Um, and so women could not go to the Juneteenth celebrations. That part of the, I mean, there were, you know, some socialization things going on, um, but they were not the predominant uh, part. The, the, the meetings and the, the speeches, et cetera, that was the big deal. Women could not go because women couldn't vote. And so it was considered pointless for them to go to learn how to vote if they couldn't vote. Um, so during those three years is when uh, there were voting rights and whatever. And then all of that came to a crashing end because Jim Crow moved to town. And Jim Crow just wiped it all out for another hundred years. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Question in the back. Uh, I just want to repeat that one. Can you I was just wondering, uh, where, where could we get that book from? So if you scan that QR code outside, we already give away have limited copies of the book already. Um, so we'll be giving books away, but also the book is available on Amazon. Just a yes. plug, also, there'll be some tonight. If it comes to tonight's program, there will be books available as well. So, a couple of different things. You already did it. No. Anybody wants to go? Question down here. You can raise your hand. Hi. Oh my gosh, you sound weird on a microphone. I don't like it. Um, so, you talked about the 10 states that were forced to to follow the rules, right? Yes. And I read in your book that was really used as a strategy during the war. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation was not written to, to I mean, they, it's in, in uh, free slaves in territory not held by the, uh, the North. Uh, so it really didn't free anybody. The, the goal of the proclamation was not to free anybody. It was to keep Europeans out of the war. Contrary to popular opinion, the Civil War was fought worldwide, 
not just over here, like they show on TV. Um, and the reason for that was because, you know, there was a lot of shipping going back, back and forth. So if a southern supply ship encountered a northern uh, battleship um, in Japan, then one of them went down. But it would be the supply ship if they didn't have enough goods or whatever. Um, so there was battling going on all over the place to keep, it, but the war was, was kind of tied between the North and South to keep from uh, tossing, uh, from changing the uh, balance uh, in favor of the South, the North had to do something to keep the European nations from joining the war. So by creating the Emancipation Proclamation, they made the war officially a question of slavery, which then the unique European nations said, whoa, we can't get into that, you know, because um, those politicians then would have to answer to their um, constituency of why they were supporting, why were we sending people out to die um, to support slavery in another nation when we don't allow slavery in our, at home, you know? And so it kept everybody out of the war, it kept the Civil War uh, between the North and South. But Lincoln said he didn't care who, you know, about free, if, if freeing the slaves, you know, helped him to win, then he would win, if, then he would free them. If, um, if he could win without freeing them, then he would do that. He just wanted to win, he didn't care, you know, about trying to, and that's, I don't remember what page it is, but if you get the, uh, one of those books, it's in there, these exact words. You know, it sounds kind of cruel, I don't care, but that's what he's saying. <laughs> you know, I just want to win, you know? And so that's what the proclamation was. While we're on proclamation, let me mention this. You know, that thing about news was late. The proclamation was issued at 7 p.m. on, the final proclamation was issued at 7 p.m. on January 1. And it went out by telegram, um, telegraph machine. Um, and those of you who are anywhere close to my age, which is probably nobody in here, you know, um, you will remember what is called uh, party lines. And party lines, everybody who had a party line knew everybody else's business, you know? Mm -hmm. So Lincoln was sitting in a room, you know, and, and they were sending the message out, you know, at seven o'clock. And everybody nationwide who was connected to uh, the wire um, got the message. You know, nationally. So that was a northern wire, there was a southern wire. The northern wire, everybody got it. The southern wire, somebody had to move it from the north to the south, but that didn't take long because they were spying on each other. <laughs> you know, and so um, everybody got the same news on the same day, around the same time. Yeah, I think to that point, uh, and that was an excellent question, to that point, uh, one of the questions from the audience was, what is the importance of Juneteenth becoming a federal holiday? And you spoke to some of that, but. Yes. Um, weird things are happening right now. Um, now, Juneteenth has been Texas property forever. And there are a lot of people in Texas that are not too happy with the idea of Juneteenth being a national holiday. Then it's like somebody you don't know celebrating your birthday, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, why is, why is South Dakota celebrating Juneteenth? What do they have to do with it? You know, so that's, the, what's coming along with that is people who are not familiar with Juneteenth are just making decisions of how it should or should not be celebrated. Hence, some of you may be aware of the trouble that Walmart got into when uh, the, uh, with that ice cream selling Juneteenth ice cream, and there was this national, you know, explosion where you know, Walmart should be wiped off the earth for selling Juneteenth, you know, ice cream. Well, 
I happen to have a book here that I wrote by accident. <laughs> and on page 179 is a picture of a uh, an ad. Um, if, if that's please, I think that's correct, 179. It's an ad for Juneteenth ice cream. And that ad was published in the 1930s. You know, and so the rest of the nation is trying to catch up and they're making, they're not asking questions. They're just make, making decisions on what should and should not happen. So I'm not certain what Juneteenth is going to end up looking like, uh, the, what the national version is going to end up looking like, um, because um, what they are, the, the opinions that they are sharing are not compatible with what we do here. Um, Juneteenth, and for many families, is an opportunity to go into the backyard with some ice cream and some, you know, watermelon, barbecue, baked beans, you know, you know the deal, yeah. <laughs> you know, and eat it until it's gone and then go next door and eat up there. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's just funny games, you know. Um, it, it's not about reverence for all of that. Another question? Yes. Yes. So this is a follow-up question to kind of that concept, and it's a little bit of an uncomfortable question, but as a person that's a white person that wants to be a supportive ally, like what is an appropriate way for me to celebrate and support the community? You know, uh, first of all, it's not an uncomfortable question for me. So thank you very much for asking it. It is a question that must be asked all over the place now because um, people are promoting, uh, media is promoting um, Juneteenth as a black holiday. And that's just not, the national holiday, that, that's just not right, you know. Um, the, um, the uh, I created an organization last year called Juneteenth University. And on our website, uh, we put up a list of all of the activities in Denton County. There are 25 of them. One of those activities is a boat party that costs $660. And I'm going to tell you, Junebug, Big Mama, and Ray Ray are not going to be there. <laughs> you know? And so, <laughs> that party is, that's just white people. <laughs> no, that party. They're not having a problem celebrating Juneteenth, you know? And so I really believe that when we get to that, we, 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 that I just have to get comfortable with it. The good thing about Juneteenth is that it is going to cause people to get comfortable, get uncomfortable first and then become comfortable because Juneteenth belongs, it's a national holiday, it belongs to everybody, we all, one nation. Even if we don't have the same political ideology, um, religious ideology, whatever, we are one nation, you know? And so white people are gonna be celebrating Juneteenth eventually, not this year, but it's gonna get to that point. Yeah, I think that's a really good question because uh, one of the things that we talk a lot about with the Denton Black Film Festival, we do uh, about 20, 22% of our audience is not black, right? And so one of the questions that is always asked, well, if I am not black, can I come? And the answer is of course, right? But um, black history is America's history, right? White history is America's history. We, we most of us celebrate St. Patty's Day, right? But you're not Irish, right? <laughs> or you may celebrate another uh, Cinco de Mayo, but you may not be Hispanic or Latino, right? So the more we learn, I believe, about others, other cultures, the better off we are, right? And just have an appreciation, right? So I just celebrate everybody's culture and, and holiday. And so that's something that you know, hopefully we can do more. So with that, uh, we are at the end. And I know that um, um, Tamara's coming back up. 
But I just want to thank you from my perspective of allowing me to participate to the city of Louisville. Uh, Darling, last thoughts as Tamara's coming up. I thank you very much for being here. This is, um, has been very enjoyable. Um, I, look, in my opinion, Louisville stepped out this year, you know, and, and uh, uh, with all the activities that you have planned, and, and I am very grateful for that. In prior years, uh, if there have been celebrations in Louisville, they have all been very private, you know, not major public events. But this year, you stepped out in style, and I, I really appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. Can we have a round of applause? So, so one last thing, I would encourage all of you, if you can, to purchase the book. The book is funny. It has a lot of data, uh, but it is, in my mind, a, a definitive, uh, it provides a definitive answer to a lot of facts about Juneteenth, right? So. Yes, and um, like I said earlier, if you would like a copy of the book, we do have a limited supply, uh, so just scan the QR code. Um, outside and then we're going to take everybody's information basically and we'll let you know how many books we have available and let you know where you can pick it up. Um, so thank y'all so much for coming. This was excellent information. Um, I think one of the things that I learned when I first met Donald was that he said, I just want you to know before we have this conversation, I'm not an expert. And so I love that because that's how he wrote his book just by kind of sheer luck he just is a historian and wanted to put it together so thank you so much for that and thank you for supporting our program thank y'all so much